So, hello. So, my name is Steve, Steve Weinstock. I work over in Engineering Tower for the Chemical Engineering and Material Science Department. I'm also pretty involved with uh, the MAE department, and I spend a lot of time over in the machine shop, over in the basement, over in Engineering Tower. So, if I kind of look familiar, it's probably because we bump into each other down in the machine shop down there. So, I acknowledge your class is advanced manufacturing techniques or fabrication techniques or something like that? Yeah, the choices I believe is exactly. Yeah. Okay. This particular shop is not that advanced. Right? So this particular shop is probably vintage mid 80s, early 80s, 80s, right? But machine technology has not changed all that much. So the stuff that I'm going to show you today and the stuff that we're going to talk about today still applies. It applies to the most expensive, most contemporary clean room CNC machine in any fabrication facility. The same principles apply, right? These machines are old. They're dirty. I'm a little bit embarrassed by this shop, actually. This is kind of a everyone's use, no one's supervision kind of a shop. So it's dirty, there's stuff all over the place. Most machine shops you'll run into are not gonna be in this condition, okay? So I started to say the machines are old, but if you were to buy a machine today, it would look exactly like this. If you were to buy a manual mill, it would look exactly like this, it would just be cleaner. You can buy this same machine today. You can probably buy that machine on the used market, right? But that is still a very viable machine, okay? So what's important today is to kind of pay attention, and it's my preference that you pay attention and get enthusiastically engaged rather than try to take a bunch of notes, right? So if you're a note taker, you're welcome to take notes, but you don't have to. If you have a question, interrupt us with the question, right? If you have that question, your neighbor probably has that question too, right? The more questions there are, the better this goes, okay? What I want to cover is some fundamental mill work. Okay, the mill is the most common and the most versatile machine in a machine shop, and it's one of the most commonly used machines in any kind of fabrication. Okay? Thank you all for putting on safety glasses. I brought a bag of them over from the chemical engineering department. Safety glasses in a machine shop are the number one mandatory must-have thing. Okay? Today, you don't need to be worried that much because I'm working with plastic, and over there I'm going to work with a, a material called Delrin, which really is not that dangerous. It's not going to spit off hot chips. It's not going to spit off things with harsh edges. So we're pretty safe today. And accordingly, we'll be okay with short pants. Okay? But in general, short pants are, are no-no in a machine shop also. As are, I saw somebody with a key loop. So those are also, yeah, if you have one and you're working in a machine shop, get rid of it or put it in your pocket. These things have very powerful spinning motors. They will win, right? If you have something hanging out of your clothing, it'll rip that thing off your clothing probably along with your clothing. Hate to tell unpleasant stories, but within the last few years, there was a death in a machine shop at a college campus back on the East Coast, and it was on a lathe. It was a young lady working on a lathe late at night by herself. So a couple rules violations already in a shop by herself late at night. Anyway, she's working. She put her head into the machine to, to kind of see what was going on, and her hair got caught in the lead screw and it just sucked her right into the machine. So, like I said, I don't mean to tell unpleasant stories, but machine shops are very dangerous places. But they're also very cool places. In my mind, it's the coolest place on any business park, any industrial park, or any campus. It's on these machines, in these vices, that all of the theory from all of the books and all of the formula and calculations that you've ever done, they get realized right here, right? In the book, it's a formula. On the exams, it's a formula. In, on these machines, it's reality, right? So you'll see, we'll talk about some of the formulas that apply to this stuff, and, and you'll see that this is the marriage of that 
that visual, that virtual world, right? In the real world. All right. Who has never been in a machine shop before? For whom is this the first time they're seeing a mill? Be honest. Okay, cool. Everybody else, you're kind of familiar with a mill? Okay, so I'll go through it a little bit quicker. You ask a question whenever you have a question. A milling machine is most like a drill press, right? And we've all worked drill presses before, or we've all at least worked a drill motor that you hold in your hand and it's got a drill on it, a drill bit. This is a typical drill bit, right? Now, ah, you guys, this is old hat, right? A drill bit, surprisingly, is good at only one thing. Anybody want to guess? Drilling a hole, and drilling a hole straight down. That's all drill bits are for. And surprisingly, a drill bit only cuts on this edge where my fingernail is, and this other edge 180 degrees opposed to it. It spins and it's forced down into a hole through material, be it wood, metal, plastic, concrete, whatever. These things along the side of the drill bit, anybody know what they're called? Flutes, correct. Flutes are for one thing and one thing only, to pull the debris out of the hole that you've just made, right? The technical term is chip evacuation. Right? It's to get the debris out of the hole. Now, big deal, right? So, what a drill does, I have a little setup here, I'll show you a drill spinning. I should have done this before the cameras got here. There is on button over there. So how exciting is that? There's the debris. There's our hole, okay? Now, we've all worked with a drill bit and you drilled a hole and the hole wasn't exactly the right size. You needed it a little bit bigger. So you took the drill and you, you kind of went like that, right? Or you pulled it back this way and you moved it around, right? And it made the hole bigger. Right? It works, but that's the complete wrong use of a drill. These flutes are not made for cutting. Right? It just happened to work because you were probably working with a steel drill and you were probably drilling in a piece of wood or something. You got a really messy hole, but it worked. Right? Drills are good at going straight down. If you want to clean up a hole on the edges, we use something called a reamer. And a reamer is kind of similar. This is what a reamer looks like. This is a small one. Reamers have a very specific diameter. So you'll drill a hole just about 10 thousandths of an inch smaller than this and slowly insert this down into that hole and this cleans up the edges of the hole. You can't use this to make the hole deeper. You can only use this to make the edges of the hole cleaner. Okay? So far, so good? So far, so what? Question? All right. Now, an end mill. 
looks a whole lot like a drill, but there are some very important differences. First of all, there's generally not a point at the bottom, right? So it's got a flat bottom. But more importantly, on an end mill, the flutes are designed to cut. They're actually sharp edges. If I run my finger along this, it'll cut my finger. Right? This one might not. It's, it's sharp enough. Right? So what we can do with an end mill is quite a bit more than what we can do with a drill. So let me reset something here. And I'll take the take the drill bit out and put an put an end mill in. There's a big mallet behind you. Could you hand it to me? Somewhere on that table? No? Thank you. Stuff that in one of those holes in there, you'll see how it goes. So similar to a drill, I can get into a piece of material. So you can come up closer and take a look. I'm in that material about that deep. But what I can do with an end mill now is I can move that material. And I can cut a slot. I can also move it in this direction. So, there you go. So what we can do with an end mill and a milling machine is carve out material, right? Well, big deal. But the big deal is that is the fundamental operation of any milling machine, right? So we get different milling operations by using different shaped end mills. So that's a pretty common, probably a half inch end mill, two flute. Here's a pretty interesting end mill that'll cut something differently. A six flute, probably three quarter inch or so. Does exactly the same thing, but it can just do it bigger and faster, right? Plastic's pretty easy. This can mill probably anything. The whole concept of machining is that your cutter is harder than the material you're cutting, right? This is high-speed steel. It can pr cut pretty much anything except for what? High-speed steel. So if you want to cut high-speed steel, go ahead, just put it anywhere. You have to step up to a harder material, and generally the harder material, anybody know? Diamonds is two steps. One step is a material called carbide. Carbide is a very, very cool material. It's very, very hard, but it's also very brittle. You'll go out and you'll spend a bit like this made out of carbide, solid carbide. It might be 40, 45, 50 bucks, maybe 60 or 70 bucks if you go to a good one, 80 or 90 bucks if you get a real good one. If you drop it, bink, 
And that's the noise you'll hear. Bing! And you've just broken that cutter, right? And that cutter won't be good for anything else. Okay, look at this cutter. This particular cutter, why don't you take, hold it from the bottom as you pass it around. On the end of it, it's got a round surface, right? So when we use that to cut, the resulting slot that we get is gonna have a curved bottom, right? And the curved bottom is gonna correspond to the shape of that cutter, right? So here's another end mill, ah, similar to that other one. It's not all that exciting. Look at this end mill. Same thing, quite a bit smaller, okay? So why is all that important? Well, that's all important because the different operations that you can do on a mill all require different cutters. Here, we'll start some on that side. This is my little bag box. Of Here, come get one. Here you go. Here, just put it there. The one that he's holding? Yeah. That's probably a lathe piece. Lathe, yeah. yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay, so any particular questions come from looking at those parts? Let me have that part. Any particular interesting questions arise? Okay. So here's the part in real versus the part in SolidWorks, right? I know in SolidWorks you can do this. I can do that too, right? Okay. So if we're gonna make this pocket here, right? How are we gonna do it? You've seen all the operations required. We're gonna put it in a vise. We're gonna put an end mill all the way through and then we're gonna navigate that end mill around this part. Now putting it all the way through, depending on the strength of the end mill we're using, that might be a little bit aggressive, right? Maybe we'll do it in two passes, maybe three. How do we get this radius on the corner? It's the radius of the end mill, right. So if you want a smaller radius, you have to use a smaller diameter end mill. Right? If you want a larger radius, you use a larger end mill. It all pretty much becomes very common sense related. There's not much trickery, okay? But here's some trickery. Hand me that one with the slots. Yeah, that one on the top. A T-slot and a dovetail. How in the world do you get that? Let's talk about this one. How in the world can you cut that? A special cutter? Good answer. So we actually use two cutters. It's, where did I put it? Here's one. We'll use, now I acknowledge this is a drill bit, but this is for demonstration. We'll use an end mill and we'll cut a slot like this, right? And that'll give us the middle slot. And then, without moving anything, we'll use another cutter that looks like this. That goes, this one doesn't fit. But it goes in that slot, right? And then cuts out the slot beneath. So this is called the T-slot. This one next to it is called the dovetail. It's the same thing, but it's got a triangular shape instead of a square shape. These are used unbelievably abundantly. Just about any device you look at that has a slide or a clamp has something like this on it. They're actually used on this mill. These slots here that hold the vise on are T-slots. Most drawers have dovetail slides. 
You guys ever work on a microscope and you slide the stage around? Slides on dovetail joints. Okay. okay, so how can we make things this precisely? That's the other cool thing about good mills or about machines in general. The cutter stays still, right? And we can manipulate our workpiece around in the X direction with this, right? You guys all know this, you've been in the shop. X direction with this, Y direction with this, and Z direction with this, up and down, or by raising the table up and down. Now, all of these dials have a little scale on them, right? So I can calculate how far I have moved something. We also have this little contraption, a DRO or a digital readout. So now I've set those coordinates to be zero, zero. And as I move any direction, I can see on that scale how far I've moved. The unit of measurement that we use in a machine shop is thousandths of inches. That's just the number that we use. So if a, if a machinist tells you take off five, he means five thousandths of an inch. Right? He says take off 10, that means 10 thousandths. If he says take off 100, it's 100 thousandths. Yeah, he should probably say take off a tenth of an inch, but he doesn't. He says take off 100. So who's not been in a machine? You have, it's news to you, right? Which of you guys, you? So what level of tolerance do you think we can achieve with a machine in terms of a thou thousandths of inches? Can we keep a tenth of an inch, a hundred thou? Can we keep a hundredth of an inch? Can we keep a thousandth of an inch? What do you think we can keep? What do you think is kind of standard? A hundredth of an inch? Okay. Who else? Have you been in a machine shop? How accurate do you think we can be? Take a guess. Okay. Where's the machine shop, guys? Go ahead. Five thou is a very good answer. Five thousandths of an inch is a very easy tolerance to keep. Generally, engineering drawings call for plus or minus five thousandths of an inch. Very easy to maintain on this machine, very easy to maintain on that machine. But there's some assumptions with that. You assume that the machine is set up properly. Okay? These are probably not. So in terms of setup, this particular machine, this head tilts this way or this way. It tilts this way or this way. It slides out this way or back this way, and it also turns like a turret. So there's a whole bunch of setup just in this head. We assume, when we start on a machine, that this head is perpendicular to that table. Right? We can put some instruments on it to check. It's probably close. It's probably within three, seven, nine, something like that. Depending on what you're making, that's probably acceptable. How thick is a piece of paper? Not the metric system in this shop. How thick is a piece of paper? How many? One thousandth. Anybody else? How many? Average piece of paper out of your notebook, the cheaper notebooks. Probably about four or five, six thousandths of an inch. One sheet of paper. So on a machine drawing, if it says an inch plus or minus five, that means an inch plus a piece of paper, or an inch minus a piece of paper. That's, that's pretty precise. Where do we need that kind of precision? Anybody? Measuring equipment, clearly, we need that kind of precision. Okay. You need that kind of precision in a car? Certain parts you do. You need that kind of precision in your iPhone? Yeah, 
Yeah, you probably do. You need that kind of precision on your kid's wagon or your little brother's wagon? No, not so much, okay? Plus or minus five is a pretty common tolerance. There are some shops, quite a few of them actually, where the tolerance that they work in is in tenths of thousandths or a ten thousandth of an inch. I have a friend, Tim, works in one. And I never really had an appreciation for that level of accuracy until he showed me the prints of what they make. He had a SolidWorks model that was just unending. And the machine that they make that has that level of tolerance is the machine that controls the lasers when you have LASIK eye surgery. So now it kind of becomes important, right? When there's a guy with a laser in my eye, I don't want some guy turning this and looking at a dial, right? So we've got quite a bit of accuracy. What do we use for accuracy? This is old hat for most of you. The most common tool, anybody know what's in the box? Cute little dial caliper, okay? Cute little six inch caliper. The more common tool, I don't know, 10 or 12 inch dial caliper, okay? Also with a micrometer. What if you have a part that's bigger? Well, here, come, here comes a surprise. You get a bigger set of calipers. <laughs> And we have calipers of all kinds of sizes. Calipers can range in price from $12 at Harbor Freight to a set of calipers, dial calipers that are this size that could be four, five, six hundred dollars. So calipers are pretty precise instruments. You don't want to carry it around in your back pocket. Right? You don't want to lay it out on the bench where chips are flying around. You always want to keep it in a case. This particular set, this is not an expensive set. This is maybe a $60, $70, $80 set for the dial calipers and the micrometer. Okay. Questions, comments, additions, deletions, corrections, suggestions, anything. Okay, you ready to take a leap of faith? Let's talk a little bit about CNC machines. Okay. But I'm gonna go back a half a paragraph. Any questions about anything on this machine? Okay. Everything that I've talked about so far pertains to a manual mill, right? Manual meaning everything on the mill is manipulated by the operator. The X direction, the Y direction, the Z direction, the up, down, the rate that I'm feeding the material, the speed at which I'm spinning the cutter, it's all controlled by me or you if you're the operator. In a CNC machine, all of that stuff is controlled by a computer, right? That's the C. NC stands for numerical control. In the old days before computers, we just called them NC machines and all that we could control was the X and Y coordinate of where to move the table. This is all based on X, Y, Z coordinates, okay? So everything that I can do on this machine has a corresponding CNC instruction. And those CNC instructions are called G-code. And I've handed you a sheet of the most common G-codes in the world, okay? Every machine manufacturer uses the common ones and they all have some of their own. So, G00, rapid travel to an X, Y, Z coordinate. I'll do it on that machine when we fire it up. When you tell the machi machine G00 to 000, the machine's gonna go And it's gonna go to what you have established to be the 000 coordinate on that machine. G01 is move at a specified feed rate to an X, Y, Z coordinate. There's hundreds of G codes, hundreds of M codes. 
and they all pertain to a specific operation that a machine is supposed to undertake. Now that's a big leap, right? From doing it manually to doing it under machine control. Okay? Ready for the leap? Are you excited? Let's trade sides. So this old beast is a Bridgeport CNC machine, vintage mid-80s or so. You'll notice that the dials we had on that machine are missing from this machine, right? I have no dial to move my Y, I have no dials to move my X, and I have, I have no lever to move my Z. It's all controlled by this. A nice modern, it's got a mouth. So I have it in a mode now where it's got some manual control for jogging. So there's this dial. For jogging X. This button for jogging Y. Right. So you can see the machine is being moved by a step motor in here. or a step motor over there. So I can move it with this button for rapid. I can also move it with this dial. Can you see that it's moving? So if I want to position something pretty precisely, I can use this dial. Right? Everything is based on an X, Y, Z coordinate. Okay? I'm going to manipulate my workpiece under a spinning cutter according to those coordinates. Okay. So, I've written a little program which will stuff in here. So this particular machine, it's, it's got semi-rapid tool changers, right? So there's a cutter in here, which I'm just going to put in the machine, right? And I've already written and loaded a program, so I'm just going to turn it on and let you see some of the some of the uh, computer controlled operating rather than me manipulating it. Oops. Okay. So my program's loaded. I'm going to put it in a mode. Oh, no, I won't. The first step in my program is a position step. So it's to a start position. The next step in my program was a Z position. I don't know if you saw that move or not. The next position, the next step in my program is actually making a part. So since you all have glad, you can step up and watch it actually cut. So you can see that Z is coming down a little bit. So come on up. Don't be shy. Come and take a look at it.
So now it starts to get interesting. There's a prize for whoever can tell me what this is going to be. show you when it gets to a break point. program is now at a point where it has done as much as it can with this cutter. And that cutter is a quarter inch in diameter. I'm asking it to make some cuts where a quarter inch is too big of a cutter. So what do I need? Smaller cutter. So we have this tool tray back here where that was labeled Somebody put the tool tray in backwards. That's supposed to be tool one. This is tool two. This is a cutter that's an eighth of an inch in diameter. So I'll stuff it in the machine. Okay. So there's a couple things that were at play there. First of all, my program has to know when to change the cutter. It needs to do as much as it can with that first cutter before we change to the second cutter. Plus, changing cutters takes a lot of time, right? So if you're in a production mode and you have to make 10,000 of these before you can go home, you want to minimize the amount of time you're screwing around with tools, okay? So a contemporary machine will have something called an automatic tool changer. It'll be a big locker over here that'll have probably eight or 10 or 12 tools in it. And when the program comes up to a tool change, an arm will come out, take the tool off of the machine and put a new tool on the machine. It happens in about a second and a half or two. And you're done. The operation is it's incredibly fast. There are some machines that are used in big factories where the tool changer is a room behind the, the, the mill and it has a conveyor belt and it will hold three or four hundred different tools. And there will be a guy whose job it is to do nothing but put tools on that particular tool crib supply belt. Right? And then everybody who writes programs for that machine knows tool one is this, tool two is that, right? They, they'll probably have 50 drills. They'll have 50 end mills that have all kinds of different tools, okay? So tool changing is a really, really cool part of automated machining. Okay, anyway, I've changed the tool, so go. Position, start start. So now it gets kind of fun.
story. Correct. Take it. So <laughs> the question came up as that was machining itself, how long does it take to write a program? Well, before we answer how long it takes, time-wise, that program, to cut out that piece, here's page one of that program. It's for you guys to have page one. So you'll see it's a lot of those G codes, which are just calling out the position to move the workpiece to, right? So you have page one of my program. The program is, I think it's 1,600 1, lines of code. So you have this page. There's eight pages and I think I have I mean, there's eight per page, and I have at least 10 pages here. Okay. Now, do you think I actually sat down and calculated every single XYZ coordinate of that? Yeah. Thank you. I didn't. Okay. So that's the next leap we're going to take. How many of you use SolidWorks? Okay. SolidWorks, CATIA, Rhino, AutoCAD, MasterCam. There's a whole collection of CAD related software. They all have a plugin that will end with CAM. CAD stands for Computer Aided Design, CAM stands for Computer Aided Manufacturing. They all have a plugin. And what that, or, or an auxiliary program or a secondary processor, right? All that that does is takes your design and translates it into G code and M code for a machine to make that part. That's the concept. It's not quite that simple because you have to call out in your part, as you made a layer in your part. You have to equate that layer now to a block of code in the CAM module to say, right, I want you to do this layer first. My first layer was the rough cut with the quarter inch. My second layer was a finer cut with the eighth of an inch, right? Now, if you watched that thing work, it was not the most optimal path to carve out that part. At the time, I really didn't care. Right? I'm making one of these. I make one a day. I'm happy. I don't need to make 10,000 of them. Right? If you're making 10,000 of them, you're going to optimize that CAM part to make it as quickly and as efficiently as possible by minimizing tool changes and taking the most efficient paths. Okay? Now, you really only saw X and Y moving, right? The part that I really made was this. Pass that one around. Now you'll see in that, on top, I made this in a, in a piece of software called Rhino. 
on top of the think, like you saw here, I laid a groove into it. I think the specific, the specific element that I used was called a torus. And a torus kind of looks like a donut, right? So I just took the edge of a donut and laid it into think, right? Which made the final cutter go through it and cut that groove. But the last time I gave this demo, oh, so how do I get that, how am I gonna get a groove like this if the bottom of my cutter is square? I need a cutter that's got a ball end. Well, I had a ball end cutter and it broke, right? I was setting up for this demo and I did a thing and I heard pink. That's the noise I heard, right? And then subsequently I found that piece, right? So cutters break. So where's my little part? Why did I do that? Why do we do lots of things in machine shop? Who's got the little part? Because we can. It's nothing but holding my little magnet. That's all it is. So lots of concepts, but they all are the fundamental stuff of any CNC machine. Be it this size of stuff, or huge stuff, or micro stuff, or nano stuff. Okay? Yeah. Uh, it can, if, if there's something that the CNC can't do, is it gonna know that it can't do it? Or is it just gonna kind of power through anyways? Excellent question. The question is, what if you want to do something that your CAM software, how smart is the, SAM co the CAM software is our, real, is our real question. A couple of components to that. In CAM software, you tell it what kind of machine you're generating code for. The important part of that is you tell it, I'm generating code for a two-axis machine, which means there's no Z. I'm generating code for a three-axis machine a four axis machine, a five axis machine, a six or a seven axis machine. The more expensive the CAM package is, the smarter it is. But you still need to know. It still is a big leap between what software can do unknowingly and what you want to do with the part you're trying to manufacture. It's quite a leap. Okay, good question. So this is three axis, X, Y, and Z, what's a four axis machine? Yeah. In addition to those, the table goes like this. What's a five axis machine? The table goes like this. Right? So there's five. Six and seven, they're all different. You can get head movement or you can get this guy to move a little. Okay. So there's some pretty fancy machines out in the world. I have a friend who works down in North San Diego County, CNC programmer, John, John Primack. Works on a seven axis machine. I don't even know what he uses to program it now. Works with pretty exotic materials. He makes teeth. There's an emerging industry. You all have had x-rays on your teeth? Well now they can scan your mouth inside and out and they make a 3D model out of it and they send it to some software package and some guy, right, transposes that through his CAM module into a CNC program that gets shipped off to John and gets loaded into his factory. I don't think he makes a single tooth, right? I think he makes a whole part of a mouth of teeth, but so they can make teeth with CNC machines. How do you think they make replacement hip bones and replacement knees? CNC machines. So if you've got the engineering wherewithal to, to design the stuff and, and the fabrication wherewithal to manufacture it or to be smart enough to get it into CAM, to get it into a CNC program, there's a job for you anywhere, anytime, anywhere in the world, guaranteed. Questions, comments, additions, deletions, corrections, suggestions. Man, you guys are quiet. What's I, the course of getting like, um, I know there's like certified or CAM program basically. 
what's the kind of process and what kind of qualifications does it give you? So there's a number, excellent question. The question is, basically the question is how do you become a machinist or how do you become an engineer? So it's not just a bunch of old guys like me and the other Steve and Ted, right, hanging around in shops, and, right? There actually is discipline and industry around it. These are just four of hundreds of textbooks, right? Everything that I talked about in a simple sentence is a chapter in this book, right? And these are just the beginning books, okay? So the most recent one that came out, and it's a pretty darn good book, is this one from an organization called NIMS. I even forgot what it stands for. National Institute of Metal something something. And they actually give you credentials. They actually give you credentials about being a machinist, right? There's various levels of being a machinist. And what a machinist can do is can take your drawing, if you're the engineer, and he can fabricate that part. Journeyman machinist, I don't know, seven, 10, 12 years, right? And you finally know your way around pretty well. But that's the old stuff, right? The new stuff where it's all CNC controlled and computerized. Most of the guys nowadays that are machinists don't have the computer background, right? So another related question is how long does it take to become a manufacturing engineer, which is different than a machinist? And that, I don't know, you know? You can do it forever. A friend of mine that just graduated here is now work from here is now working at Panasonic Avionics, doing in-flight entertainment uh, systems at a prototype CNC machine shop. Because before they make 10,000 of them to put them in the plane, they have to make a couple of them that go through testing and all of that. Right? He went through a PhD program here. Right? He's not using some of his PhD work down there, but I mean it takes time takes a lot of time. So there's becoming a machinist, there's becoming a manufacturing engineer. Orange Coast Community College over in Costa Mesa has an excellent machine shop program. The introductory course is 16 weeks. And that's eight weeks on a mill, eight weeks on a lathe, and that's just the beginning. That's just the introductory course of probably eight courses, and then you come out a certified machinist. And then you can get a job as an entry level machinist just about anywhere. And then from there, it's just your own enthusiasm and ambition, you know, it can take years. It can be a career. Right? You can do it for a profession, you can do it for a hobby. Good question. What else? Somebody else has got to have a question. You got to. You must have a question. Nothing? <laughs> yeah. Well, I encourage you to, uh, to pursue engineering, I encourage you to pursue fabrication and manufacturing. The, uh, there's two trends that are kind of prevalent now. One trend is manufacturing is coming back from China. Right? We learned our lesson over years and years. We learned our lesson. That's not to say China is a lousy fabricator, lousy manufacturer. They can make some wonderful stuff, but they can also make some pretty sloppy stuff. You get what you pay for. And for quite a while now, we've all been pretty thrifty, right? And we've been buying cheap stuff. So they've been making cheap stuff. So it's been working. But the tide is turning. There's much more interest in quality stuff now. So manufacturing, high-end manufacturing is coming back. That's the first trend. The second trend is all the machinists are old guys. Old guys. You go into a shop, it's going to be old, gray-haired guys running machines like this. Right? You go to some of the newer shops, it's going to be young guys like you, and it's going to be full of computers. It's not going to look like this. It's going to look like the room out there. There's going to be screens and monitors and computers and 3D printers and prototype stuff. Right? There are few of those folks. Us old guys, we're done. So there's a tremendous opportunity in manufacturing engineering. In, in, in all industries, right? In the medical industry, in the automotive industry, in the aerospace industry. That's my pitch. What else? 
Man, you guys have been the quietest group ever. Okay, that's it. Boom. That's a wrap. Thanks, Steve. You're welcome. Yeah.